Okay. Okay, so uh, work of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, part two. All right, so let's uh, continue. I hope you have your Bibles open. So um, uh, we're going to look at, uh, we've been studying through the book of Acts and the work of the Holy Spirit because we want to see what the Holy Spirit did through the lives of ordinary people. Okay, in all that we have seen now, uh, we see that these are ordinary people, just like you and I. Okay, uh, people with faults, people with limitations, people with serious problems. Right? If you look at Peter, the way you know he denounced, denied the Lord, but the Lord restored him. The Lord filled him with the Holy Spirit, and we see you know what he could do. And we see, you know, all these people who are uh, really ordinary people, you know, who had actually abandoned the Lord at one point, right? But the Lord restored them, the Lord filled them. And so when we look at ourselves, right, when we look at our own lives, okay, um, so this is what we can conclude, that the Lord, the Holy Spirit, can do amazing things, can really rewrite the script of our lives, right? completely rewrite it or give us a fresh start right? and and set us on the course of a life that's exciting, challenging, no doubt, at the same time fulfilling, right? Because, uh, you know, when we walk in his plan and purpose, it's a fulfilling life. And it need not be, you know, quote unquote, full-time ministry. It can be full-time ministry, but whatever we are doing, right, in whatever you know sphere God places us, whatever environment God places us, you know, to be led by the Spirit, right, to actively seek Him, seeking to please Him, seeking to receive instructions from Him, you know, that's a great life. Okay, so we are we are studying through this and then we are you know learning all these things, right? Okay, so we looked at uh, chapter seven verses 51, verse 55, right? Um, okay, so let's move on to chapter 8 and verse 10. Okay, chapter 8, verse 10. So chapter 8, another ordinary man, Philip, he goes to Samaria. And it's amazing to see in what circumstances he goes to Samaria. Okay, anybody? Why does he go to Samaria? As you know, Philip goes to Samaria. He uh, does he get invited for a meeting in Samaria, Samaria? Invited by some church. Why do you think he goes there? Okay, just read eight chapter eight. Why do you think he goes to Samaria in the first place? See, in Samaria, amazing things happen. Okay, there's a great revival. People are set free. People hear the gospel. Uh, many turn to Christ. But why does Philip go in the first place? Yeah, Philip was actually running for his life. Right? Because there was persecution. Chapter 8, verse 1. And who was doing the persecution? Who was the chief architect? You know, who was driving this persecution campaign? Saul. Right? He's just planning things. Okay, you go there, you go here, persecute, put people in prison, draw them, we call them out. He's, you know, he's just driving this whole thing. There's great persecution, and because of which there was people were scattered, right? And one of them who ran to Samaria was Philip. But the amazing thing is that Philip goes there, he's running for his life, and we read about uh, we read this. Um, in verse 4, therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. You know, I find that very challenging, inspiring, motivating, right? It was not in the best of circumstances. Just imagine you're being persecuted, which means that you pick whatever you can and you're running for your life, right? Maybe you're living out of one bag, maybe even not that. 
you don't know where your next meal will come maybe you know some people they say hey can i stay it's it's all very uncomfortable situation right and it says that they went those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word and i believe it's because of their connect of their fellowship with the lord through the holy spirit it's only only because of that otherwise why would they do you know they because the lord said you know the holy spirit fills you and you will be witnesses with power and this is one way in which they witnessed which is amazing like no comfort you know fearing for their lives but they went and preached the gospel so anyway philip was one such person right that is what we see he went and he preached and 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 amazing things happen uh, it says in um, verse 7 for unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed and there was great joy in that city you see wickedness and the work of uh, satan is removed people who were in bondage now are free and there was great joy okay we see that where the spirit of the lord is there is freedom and the kingdom of god we see is righteousness peace and joy in the holy spirit so they experienced that firsthand right they were set free there's a king they experienced the rule and reign of the king and there was joy in the city right they experienced great joy and it says here that there was a man named Simon who was a was a practicing uh, in black magic and all those things he was a sorcerer and um, he was also he also believed and he was baptized and he continued with Philip verse 13 says and he was amazed seeing what was happening um, uh, all the wonders and all the miracles he was one he was amazed okay then we see that uh, the apostles come there that is Peter and John come there and when they had come down I'm reading verse 15 who when they had come down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit okay so the apostles knew now you know, there's there's something that we have received how did that happen we was in the upper room we were praying we were in one accord something supernatural happened God filled us and Peter knows I was there surrounded by these people uh, I was, they were asking me, shooting questions at me. I was filled with the Holy Spirit. I prayed. I, I spoke to them with boldness. And he also remembers, you know, we went to this peop went to this place uh, after people, you know, told us not to preach the gospel. We were there in the room. All of us were praying with one accord. The room was shaken. The place was shaken, and we were filled with the Holy Spirit. And we went out and preached the word with boldness. So he remembers all that. So he knows that hey. You're a believer, you need the Holy Spirit, right? So Peter and John come there, and this is what they do. The first thing they do is that they come down, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. There was already great joy in that place. They were already experiencing you know, deliverance and freedom and all, everything. It, it says uh, that, um, you know, that they... Um, they, they, you know, so the church was born. Multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip. Verse six says, "Multitudes with one accord heeded the things. You know, they listened. They, their hearts were open. So they already received Christ. And then here we see that they prayed that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, for as yet uh, he had fallen upon none of them. They had been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Okay. Verse seventeen. Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to them, said to him, Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. Okay, so we see something here, something tangible, something amazing happened because they laid hands and prayed. And people were filled with the Holy Spirit. So it doesn't say whether they spoke in tongues. It doesn't say whether they prophesied. But something tangible, something supernatural happened. So much so that this sorcerer who was used to all this black magic arts, he saw this and he said, hey, I want that. Like he had believed. But he said, no, I want this. I'll So that when I lay hands on people, 
I want them to experience the same thing. Okay, so good. I mean, it's a good thing, but wrong motive, right? Because he was a black, I mean, he was a sorcerer, and he used to do this. People used to say, oh, this is the great power of God whenever he did these things, right? But see, so that's what they said, right? In, in verse 10, this man is the great power of God. From the least to the greatest, this is what they said. So he wanted the same thing. Now suddenly, he's saying, you know, people are set free, and that power is not there anymore in his life. People are praising Jesus, and 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 maybe he felt that, hey, I need to get some of that reputation back. I need to get some of that fame back, right? So he says, um, you know, give me this. I'll give you money. You give me this, so that when I lay hands on people, they will be, uh, they will also receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, and Peter rebukes him. Okay, so we see that something tangible happens. Uh, so many things that we can learn. Uh, first of all, we see that for a believer, you know, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit is something important, is something foundational, something basic. There's no need for us to shy away from it, no matter what background people come from, right? Maybe as a you know, as a person who's ministering. This is something which is natural. You share the gospel. Yeah, our people, believers, will have they have they put their trust in Jesus? Yeah, just you know, just pray for them to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Something very, you know, something very basic, something very foundational. Right? That is what we see in the New Testament church, and we see that something tangible happens every time. You know, uh, there's a, we can expect um, uh, that. Um, uh, some, uh, something tangible happens. We can expect uh, something um, supernatural when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, there's a question here. Holy Spirit is with every believer. Then why, why does it say in Acts 16 that the Holy Spirit had not yet come down? Okay, so um, so that's um, yeah, Krishna. So uh, see a question. So so the thing is this. You know, we see that there is a uh, you know two two things we see right now. The believers. As believers, when we receive Jesus, we we have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Okay, we have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, no doubt about it. But the Holy Spirit comes upon us in a way that is different. Okay, so that is why he says here, the Holy Spirit had not come upon them. Uh, in verse sixteen, you are referring to, um, for as yet he had fallen upon none of them, so they had only been baptized in the name of the. So it doesn't say that they did not have the presence, but it says it, they did not. He, um, you know, he had not fallen upon them. So there's a difference between Holy Spirit in me and the Holy Spirit on me, upon me, right? So, so it doesn't negate the fact that the Holy Spirit's presence was not there, but the fact is that he had not. They had not been. You know, they had not experienced the truth. Or the uh, or had the encounter of the Holy Spirit upon them, right? You know, many examples, right? We so we see that how how did they become believers? It's it's only because they were convicted uh, by the Holy Spirit, right? And also in the Book of Acts, we see that they were all praying; they had all become followers of the Lord Jesus, but they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And in fact, the Lord Jesus told the disciples specifically, these people who were following him, upon whom, uh, to whom he said, you know, breathe, he breathed upon them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. We saw that scripture also. And to them, he said, you wait. So there is a difference between the Holy Spirit indwelling me and the Holy Spirit coming upon me, which is what verse 16 refers to. Right? Um, does that clarify? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure. And um, you know we'll we'll see that in uh, some more detail when we uh, address the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Right. Okay. Fine. So let's look at. Um, okay. We were looking at uh, Acts chapter eight, uh, one to twenty. Right. Okay. Let's look at um, verse twenty nine. And you know. Now this is what is happening again with Philip. Philip, you know, he's ministering there in Samaria. All these amazing, wonderful things are happening, and um, God tells Philip, you know, we see that in, um, yeah, we see that in verse twenty-six. Now an angel of the Lord 
spoke to Philip. Okay, I'm in chapter 8, verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which is which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went. Okay, so um, okay, something that we see here, you know, there's amazing things happening here, but Philip is very sensitive to the voice of God. Right? the instruction of God, and he obeys nevertheless. Right? He didn't say, okay, God, you know, I, I'm needed here. I need to do these things. There's outpouring happening here. You know, I need to minister. You know, how can I move? Nothing. You know, he was so convinced that God spoke to him through this angel, and he just moved. Right? So he arose and went. Verse 27, right? Verse 29, then the Spirit spoke. Uh, let's, let's just read. So he, uh, verse 27 onwards, so arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. Okay. So the, for Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? So something that we um, uh, learn here as well, um, you know, what is that? The thing is that Philip was again sensitive to the voice of God, okay? And God can give very specific instructions, okay? It's not just, okay, you will worship me or you know some some very broad categories like today you know uh, glorify me uh, stuff like that right which is which is also you know, how, how god can speak but god speaks in very specific ways go overtake that chariot right so get god can god do that today no so in today's what would be a parallel like instruction for you, maybe as a student, what do you think? If the Holy Spirit were to speak to you, something on these lines, go overtake the chariot. Okay. Yeah, can just be a little more specific, no? Okay. Okay, so go pray for that person. Okay, right. Anything else? Just try to think, right? Because we are we are thinking. Okay, Holy Spirit will only do ministry related, of course. Right? Tell a stranger about Jesus. Okay, tell a stranger. Okay, and uh, where would the stranger be? Where would the stranger be? You know, just just use your imagination. Where could he be? Like, yeah, but <laughs> be specific. Where could the stranger be? Let's say you're from home. You're, where could the stranger be? On the road. Okay, so you're coming, and on the road. You're going somewhere and you feel compelled that I need to, you know, say hello to this lady and, uh, you know, uh, talk to her. Yeah, whatever, right? Or it could be, um, okay, yeah, Chaya, it is wise to obey the voice of God. True, correct. Or it could be you get up in the morning and say, you know, God says, okay, I just want you to. You know, you uh, you know, give a gift, a present. Okay, why don't you why don't you just bake a cake and uh, take it to the class, <laughs> take it to the Bible college. You know, maybe after lunch they can have it as a dessert. Do something. It can be as specific as that, right? Holy Spirit is a person. Right? It can be very specific, and sometimes we we don't know the outcome of it. The full outcome of it. Philip, go overtake the chariot. Okay. Why, Lord, why that chariot? <laughs> I 
I don't think I can overtake the chariot is going. Okay, he's reading, so obviously he didn't go very fast, but I'm just thinking. No questions, right? He just did, he just obeyed. And uh, we he, he didn't know the outcome, full outcome of it when he started doing it. Right? Just think about it, because many times when we want to do, when we say, okay, God, you spoke, and we want to ask God, God, so after that, what God? Okay, I go meet him, then what do I do? Okay, I go say, then, then what if, what if that person says something else? What if God? You know, we have all those questions, right? And that stops us from having an adventure, from going on an adventure with the Holy Spirit. Right? That stops us. That prevents us. We are like, okay, God, maybe it's just my imagination. <laughs> maybe, you know, I've been listening to this Holy Spirit class. Maybe it's just because of that. I'm psyching myself up. Let's, let's not do it. Right? But the fact is, God could be speaking to your heart. He's saying, why don't you do this simple thing? Right, and uh, and you do it, and then it opens up. So Philip did this, and let's look at the other. Um, uh, you know, go near and overtake this chariot. Verse thirty-four. So Philip ran to him. So he had to run, and he heard him speaking the prophet Isaiah, uh, reading the prophet Isaiah, and then he asked the, he asked the question, "Do you understand?" Okay. So, you know, sometimes it, it happens this way that you take that first step, and then you just get curious, you get interested, and you just ask, you have a normal conversation. And that normal conversation led to um, this man, this Ethiopian uh, eunuch, receiving Christ, being baptized in water, okay, and going back to the nation and opening up the nation for the gospel. One man, it just takes one person, right? He's an official. Obviously, he'll go and share. Hey, something interesting happened on the way back. I was coming back, and this man came, this asked me, and this thing, and I, and I know that Jesus is Lord. This is what was prophesied in Isaiah. I was reading it. I didn't know it. This man explained, and he, he was so convicted that he actually said, I want to be baptized in water. Just think about it. Like they were on that trip, and then he sees water by the side. You know, why can't I be baptized? Right, which means Philip told him everything. What happened uh, when Peter, uh, you know, shared the gospel, and you know, when people coming and all that he would have shared. Right? Okay. So the thing is this: to obey the the leading of the Holy Spirit. Um, okay. Let's look at uh, verse thirty nine. Verse thirty nine. Now, when he had come out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more and he went on his way rejoicing okay. so it says that the the eunuch saw uh, he came out of the water but then philip was taken away by the holy spirit right. something supernatural you know maybe for us who are living in today and uh, you know with all this technology and everything uh, we think okay can god really do that today you know uh, I can, I can take the, I can take an Ola, I can take a Uber, I can go to this place, I can take the metro, you know, I can. Why, why should I, you know? But actually, I remember reading this book. Uh, I don't know how many of you read it. The Heavenly Man. Have you read it? Heavenly Man. It's about. Um, I forget the name of the, the pastor, um, a pastor of an underground church in China, and he writes about, you know, many many things. You know, how he came to the Lord, how he was persecuted, and he writes about some of those. You know, experiences. He says, you know, that he had to actually go past some two, three hills to that village, two, three mountains. Okay, so he's running. He says he's actually going to minister, or whatever. He's running, and it's already evening. It's already dark, and and he's thinking, you know, how can I go? You know, how can I go past these things? Uh, it's going to take a long time. But suddenly, he's he's running, and he finds himself in that mountain. You know. Like, but you can't explain it because actually there are, there are at least three mountains uh, along the way. He has to, you know, uh, cross those. But then he runs and he he finds himself in that last mountain where he's supposed to go. Right. So he's referring to that. He's saying, "I can't explain it. It's the work of God. I was going for that meeting to share there, and then this is what happened." Okay. So God can do amazing things. We don't have to box him. 
and say, you know, with our finite thinking, with our finite, you know, reasoning, right? God can do amazing things. And this is what he did. And this is what we see here. Okay, let's move on. Okay, chapter 9 and uh, verses 17 and 18. Okay, chapter 9, verse 17. This is this is about chapter whole of chapter 9, if you, uh, I mean, uh, chapter 9 starts with Saul becoming uh, a believer. Right? He's on the road to Damascus. He has an encounter with God, and he and uh, he falls off the the animal that he was traveling in, and he's he cannot see, and um, and the instruction is that he should go to the city, and he will be told what he needs to do. Okay, so Ananias, a, a disciple who was at Damascus, he has a vision. Okay, so the book of Acts is all about a lot of supernatural things which are natural over there everyday occurrences right um, so he has a vision god speaks the lord said in a vision ananias and he said and he said here i am lord so you know uh, I, I know this is not a reference to the holy spirit but then just want us to be aware of this that god speaks in visions that god speaks in dreams and God speaks, not just casual conversation. He might do that also, saying, "Oh, you know, you're a precious child. You know, you, I care for you." He might do that also, and He will. But He also gives some very important instructions. This was an important instruction, right, to Ananias. What was the instruction? Go meet Saul. And He gives the address: arise and go to the street. Okay, it's like saying, "Okay, Narayana Pura cross." Whatever you know, it's like that, right? Saying, go to that street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas. He's giving the name of the person who's staying in that house, and he inquire for this man Saul. Now Ananias knows about Saul, so immediately he says, "God, <laughs> did I hear right? Are you sure about this guy? You know what he's done to your saints in Jerusalem, right?" So. The, God is patient. He says, go for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, etc. So Ananias goes. So this is what happens when he goes there, verse 17. Uh, Ananias went his way, entered the house, laying his hands on him. He said, brother, Paul, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay. so. He says, Brother Saul, you know, because he knows God has encountered him. Saul has accepted the Lord. And uh, he says, you know, this is why I came, that you might receive your sight and that you might receive the Holy Spirit. More important, you know, that you might receive the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. Okay, so um, this baptism, it refers to the Holy Spirit baptism. He was baptized with the Holy Spirit because he said he arose and he was baptized. And uh, did anything supernatural happen? Well, we do not know. It's not mentioned here, but we do know that you know all the gifts and everything started operating in his life because he writes about that to the Corinthian church. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14. It's all about the gifts, how... They, we need to desire them, how it should be uh, for the edification of the fellow believer and all that, right? So we see that. Okay, let's move on to um, verse 31, chapter 9. Okay, then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. Now, what is he referring to? It's talking to the fact that Saul had stopped his persecution. He had become a believer, says, then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace. So which means, which tells something about Paul, actually. The fact that whatever job he did, he did a fantastic job. <laughs> he did a thorough job, right? So when it was persecution, he made sure it was people who were persecuted, right? He made sure that he would, nothing was left undone. So it says here, then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace. Because 
the persecution had stopped, whatever Saul was carrying out, okay, and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. Okay, so there's another thing. What is the name of the Holy Spirit in Greek? Uh, I mean, in the sense, uh, sorry, what is it? Not, that's not the question. Like, the question is like, how Jesus explained the Holy Spirit. You know, he said he's the comforter. And he's the helper, he said. And he will help. The one who comes alongside, you know, the, the Greek word is allos, para, parakletos, meaning the one who is like me, who will come alongside and help me, help you. Right. So here we see that they walked in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so uh, a very important thing, you know, many times we, we use that word, okay, God comforted, fine. But the thing is, for, for a person who needs comfort, for a person who's grieving, right, comfort is a big thing. Right, uh, I just want to share this, uh, you know, this quick personal thing, right, what happened was uh, I lost my father um, to uh, 2021, okay, January. Mm -hmm. Um, Daniel III passed away, and um, the thing is, uh, God actually, you know, I, I, I experienced God spoke, saying, "Okay, you know, He's at peace," and so I, it was so strong in me. That is fine, but for my mother, it was a, um, it was a big thing, right? Because my father and mother were always together, right? In the sense, if she's in the kitchen. You know, cooking, he'll be doing something, you know, cutting something, washing. Something. They were always together. Any, any, you know, social gathering, wedding, they'll go together. So for her, it was too much. The separation was too much. The grief was too much. She couldn't sleep at night, and she was uh, just seeing her suffer. Right. So I just prayed, God, you know, some of you need to comfort her. You need to console her, God. Because I, I can try my best, you know, I can I can be there, but I can't be there all the time. I can use words, but you know, I know to some extent, you know. So I just pray, Lord, you know, you are the comforter. You comfort. And uh, so I used to, you know, she stays about seven hours away from here. So I used to go visit, spend time, how are you? A night and all I, I've seen, you know, she won't be able to sleep. And this happened for some time. And and on, on one occasion when I went, um, I saw that there was change, right? So I, I asked her, you know, what happened? She said, she asked, she, she told me about a dream that she had and uh, how that dream explained a lot of, because she had a lot of questions, right? She had a lot of questions like, um, you know, why wasn't he healed and what and, and so on. So she said, you know, God showed me this dream and he explained to me, you know, all the things that had happened. And uh, and I understood. Okay. So from then on, I saw there was a difference. Why? Because God had brought him comfort. He brought him comfort in a through a dream. Right? No amount of human reasoning and sitting and saying, "Oh, you know this thing. Look at this chapter verse. Come on, you need to be strong." It didn't work. But one dream from God, one explanation from God, she was comforted. And I was I was really relieved, you know. She was she was strong, she was very different completely. So you know that they walked in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. So for those who are grieving, from then on I said, Yeah, you know, the best thing I can do as a pastor, you know, visiting home, maybe somebody's grieving, somebody's you know, hurting and they've lost someone. And sometimes, you know, especially during this COVID time and you know, a lot of things happening and and uh, you can't really, you know. You can't reason things out. The best thing is to entrust them to the comfort of the Holy Spirit, to the comforter, and say, God, you speak. You bring that comfort. And uh, for him, it just maybe a word. It could even be the presence, just the presence of God. No words spoken. No words. What do I feel? Just his presence. Is it comforting? Absolutely. Can you give any reason? No, I can't. <laughs> right? The peace of God, beyond our understanding, so also the comfort of God. Okay? So they walked in the 
comfort of the comforter, the parakletos. Okay, so we see that in chapter 9, verse 31. Okay, let's move on to Acts uh, chapter 10. The Acts chapter 10, verse 19. Again, uh, very exciting things happening here. You see that conversation, you know, every conversation that the disciples have with God, it says here that the Holy Spirit spoke, the Holy Spirit led, the Holy Spirit showed. Okay, so we can we can say, Holy Spirit, you show. There's nothing wrong. God, you show. God, you you know. God, Holy Spirit, you you lead me, you guide me, and uh, He will He will do that. Right? We see here, chapter ten, verse nineteen. It says, um, when Peter thought about the vision. So just before that, Peter's had the vision. Okay, he's hungry. He wanted to eat, but the food was not ready. And he had a he fell into a trance, and um, he saw heaven opened and a great sheet. You know, all of us are uh, familiar with this, right? A great sheet and a lot of uh, animals. And the what? Are the, what is the voice from heaven saying? Peter, rise, kill, eat. So Peter saying, no, 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 God. You know, I'm a Jew. You know, this is these are all unclean things. How can I eat this? How can I eat this? So. Three, th three times it happens, and uh, and then uh, what uh, the voice he heard the voice. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. Okay, so um, so this happened, and then uh, it was the object. That is the end of it, right? End of that experience, and then. Peter's thinking, okay, what what could this mean? I had this vision. No, what does it mean? So then, verse 19, we see, uh, let's read verse 18. And they called, um, actually, it's from 17 onwards. Now, while Peter wondered within himself what this vision uh, which he had seen meant, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius, okay, so that's the Roman um, centurion, from his house they had come. The men who had sent from Cornelius made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. When Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, and go down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Okay. So again, here also is a very important instruction. Because God is about to do something very you know, uh, something for the first time, right? There is non-Jewish people are going to hear the gospel. They're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, right? So this is uh, this is very important. So the Spirit says to Peter, "Go with them. Don't doubt anything." Okay. Now we need to understand. You know, Peter is a Jewish man. And God prepares him beforehand, showing that sheet with all those animals, and which a non-Jewish per, which a Jewish person should not actually be, uh, you know, involved in. And He gives that, so, and this, and here comes this specific instruction. So, instruction comes from the Holy Spirit, and we know the rest of the incident, right? He goes there, he preaches, people receive, people also are filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's it, right? Amazing things happen there. Okay. Um, if we read um, 44, it, it talks about that. While Peter was still, still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized, who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, that they asked him, then they asked him to stay a few days. Okay. So, so this is what happens. He's preaching. The Holy Spirit uh, you know, the, uh, falls upon them. Those who heard, which means that they heard, they received, they believed, and 
this, those of the circumcision were astonished. Those Jews were astonished. Why were they astonished? Like Peter had, Peter himself had preached that message, saying, "This gift of the Holy Spirit is to you, your children, and to all those who are afar off, whom the Lord will call." But in his mind, he was probably thinking all the Jewish people. You know, all the Jewish people whom the Lord will call. But here he sees, you know, these are non-Jewish people. He's a Roman centurion, and who is actually worshipping God, right? And and God gives him an instruction, and gives Peter an instruction to go, and he's preaching, and something amazing is happening. So they were amazed. Why were they amazed? Because they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God, because the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. Okay, so um, you know we see that salvation is for all. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is for all, all those who believe in Christ. Okay, now we see another thing. Forty-seven. You know, sometimes we hear this preaching. Okay, you need to be baptized in water. Only then you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so here it is actually ulta, right? They are filled with the Holy Spirit, and then Peter says, "Hey, I need to baptize them. Right? Why should I stop?" So they are baptized in water, right? Okay, then let's uh, let's move on. Chapter eleven, okay. Uh, Acts chapter eleven, verse twelve. Acts chapter eleven, verse twelve. Uh, actually, this probably we'll skip because um, he's recounting those things. Okay, Peter is actually telling because the the people were uh, the apostles and brethren. Uh, they heard that uh, the Gentiles had received the word of God, and they were all upset. You know, saying you are a Jewish person, you actually broke the law. You know, how can you go there and stay? Because they asked him to stay a few de days, he stayed. So, as a Jewish person, he's not supposed to fellowship. He's not supposed to stay. He's not supposed to eat with them, etc. But he did that. So they were all angry. On one side, okay, they were happy that they received the law word, but then they were they were upset. You know, how can we do this? How can you stay? So Peter explains to them all that had happened. Okay, so that is what we see in chapter um, chapter eleven, um, verse twelve, and also fifteen and sixteen. Okay, so let's go to um, verse twenty four. Verse twenty four talks about um, um, it's talked about Barnabas, right? He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Okay, this talks about Barnabas, who went to Antioch. Um, verse 28, it talks about Agabus, uh, a prophet, and he, again, prophesied by the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so that we see in verse 28. Okay, um, let's uh, go to chapter 12 then. Or chapter 13. Okay, chapter 13. Verse 1 to 4. Um, chapter 13 is in this place called Antioch, and there was a church there. And now, you know, Paul is doing ministry. Barnabas is there, who's actually brought him and introduced him to the disciples and so on. So um, now they have come to, they have traveled and they have come to Antioch. And it says there that they were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Menaean, uh, Herod, Saul, they're all there. Okay, verse 2, they ministered to the Lord and fasted. Okay, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted. What happened? What happened? The Holy Spirit spoke. What did he speak? What did he speak? What did he say? Read that verse. Verse 2, right? Chapter 13, verse 2. Yeah. So the instruction was about ministry. They were fasting, they were praying, they were ministering to the Lord in worship and prayer. Holy Spirit spoke. Okay. Clear instruction about who and what they need to do. Right? So can we expect in today's time, can we expect the same thing? Yeah, absolutely. Right? God will confirm, God will speak 
by his spirit right so um this is what happens now separate to me barnabas and saul for the work which i have called them then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them they sent them away so the so paul's first missionary journey starts this way right and we know the the kind of impact you know his ministry had in that surrounding region Right. His ministry, first missionary journey started this way. Right. Many ch churches were planted. Many people came to the Lord. Many leaders were raised. Right. Um, people like Timothy, Titus. We read about many who were raised because of his ministry. They'd go, you know, they'd share the gospel. People would gather to worship Jesus. And in that gathering, they would raise up leaders who would again, you know, take care of that, you know, oversee spiritual, uh, or, you know, spiritual oversight over that place. So, yeah, uh, yeah, Chai, I just see your comment here. Yeah. So this is the thing. So, so the Holy Spirit gives uh, specific instruction. God gives specific instructions ministry, right? So maybe, you know, maybe not now, but then, uh, you know, at the stage where, you know, maybe you are giving spiritual oversight to a group of people in the sense, maybe you are leading a church, maybe you're leading a ministry, you know, or even otherwise, you know, we can depend on God. We can depend on the Holy Spirit to give these kind of strategic instructions. Right? Okay, what should I do? Where, who should go where? And these instructions will be, you know, not only are they strategic, but very impactful, highly impactful. So that's what we see here. Right. Okay. Chapter third. That was chapter thirteen, verses one to four. Nine to twelve um, talks about discernment. Okay. Um, maybe we'll, we'll finish with this. Um, verse nine. Okay. They go to this place. They sail to Cyprus and they go to a place called Salamis. They preach the God. Uh, they preach the gospel there. And it says that uh, they meet someone called uh, Sergius Paulus who was a proconsul, you know, was like a governor there. And uh, this man actually called for Barnabas and, Barnabas and Saul. You know, he wanted to hear the word of God. Um, but there was someone with him. Okay, He was a sorcerer. Okay, He was Elimas, the sorcerer. And uh, he withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul from the faith. That is verse 8. Okay, so, um, so he was probably doing something, you know, he was a sorcerer, he was doing something in the spiritual realm. He was trying to block the proconsul from meeting uh, or receiving, uh, like, you know, this person receiving Jesus. So uh, the next verse talks uh, about how Paul reacted, how Saul reacted, right? So then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O oh, full of deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And, you know, and uh, it just pronounces judgment, right? Uh, that he will, he will not be able to see for a season, right? And for a time, it says, so he went blind. Uh, and then on seeing that, the proconsul believed verse 12. Then he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Okay, so he saw what it was done, but he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Okay, both he saw the signs, the wonder, he saw the power of God and the teaching of the Lord. He received the teaching of the Lord, you know, he was astonished at both. Okay, right. So we see all these things happening, Paul ministering in the power of the spirit. Okay, so that's um, Acts 13. Okay, Acts 15. Um, do we have time? Okay, Acts 15 and verse 8. Okay, so now uh, Acts 15 onwards till the end uh, of the chapter. You know, there are about six. Uh, six yeah. Um, seven references, right? So maybe you can just read through. Okay, and, uh, and just like how we did um, today, you, you can actually glean a lot of things like a lot of learnings from the way the Holy Spirit ministered, from the way people were ministered to and the way people directed. So as you read through those references, you know, in your mind, you just say, okay, God, you know, you did this, then you do it now also. You know, we're just saying, 
opening up our lives and saying, God, and our minds and saying, God, you can do it in my life in today's time also. Right? Okay. We'll uh, stop here and we'll continue next week. Okay. Thank you. Online students, thank you. God bless. Have a great weekend.